hi everybody, my name is Marguerite Arnold. Um, I, I will be speaking a little bit later. I'm both a journalist and increasingly analyst, uh, and I have a startup here in the medical space. Um, women in cannabis is a very, very big issue right now, partly because I think that there are so many faces here, and we do so many different things. I mean, I'm a tech geek. I work in finance and insurance. Um, I write about this as an analyst. But I think if you look at the wide range of women here, you will not only see the future of cannabis, I think, globally, but certainly where the future of cannabis in places like Germany is going. Why? Because if you look at the demographics of who the average patient is, right, the, the, the main driver of the market here is gonna be medical. If you look at who that person is, she is a woman, and we are in general usually left out of medical trials, at least before, and they're over 40, yay. So, so, so while I probably am the old, one of the older ones on the panel here, I think you see a wide range of issues and debates and, and, and many, many things that are falling in the, 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 the lump of women, even though as women, I think we're all pioneering very, very different different areas. So by way of introduction, I think everybody should introduce what they're doing. I would say from my perspective, the industry is looking at the face of the consumer, i.e. the patient here in Europe, and that is going to be very important going forward no matter what else it is you do. So with that, I'm going to introduce this very interesting panel of women to talk about the issues that they're facing and what they're doing here in this market. It is international. Women are absolutely pioneering the international business space. Um, and there are a lot of really, really interesting opportunities, I would say, as the major cannabis companies looking at this market. You need to be engaging women more. We are gonna be the ones who are gonna move the market here, and I would argue other places. So with that said, I'm gonna pass the mic and let everybody else do their thing. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Jade Green. I've been a cannabis consultant for five years, working mainly in the United States, now looking at international markets. A lot of my companies are publicly traded or well-funded private organizations that are looking to expand their footprint, including these international markets. A lot of my companies uh, seek my consultancy for advice on strategy as well as expansion. So I help them identify new markets that they can move into and then I help assist with license identification and asset acquisition. Another big part of what my consultancy does is help advise corporations on how to be more inclusive and diverse. And that does include um, helping them have some female executive leadership and representation, both on advisory boards and preferably on boards of directors. It's really difficult to understand the psychology of a female consumer if you don't have female representation in your executive and manage management and leadership roles. So I would encourage any of the corporations that are here today to keep that in mind because diverse leadership always leads to higher margins and a higher bottom line, which is what we're all seeking, especially when you're expanding into unknown territories. So if you don't include women in your leadership positions and your competitors do, then you're gonna be the ones wishing that you had. So with that, I'll pass the mic. Hello everyone, I'm Nastasia Bach. I think most of you already know me, but uh, those of you who don't, um, I work for Pivot Regulatory and we are specialized in political strategy, um, generally in the healthcare sector and cons consumer health and consumer protection sector and one of the areas we consult on is medical cannabis. Um, now, funnily enough, um, while there might be some uh, lack of representation of women in the cannabis industry, uh, in my company, we're more women than we are men. Um, so we actually had to try our best to hire a man, uh, and we did. So now we're, we're, we're four women and one man, and three male uh, CEOs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name's Krista Schott. I come from Salt, I live on Salt Spring Island off the coast of Vancouver in British Columbia. I'm actually Nomi and Mark's neighbor just down the road from them. Um, I have been involved in cannabis uh, for the last 14 years since we moved out to British Columbia. We got a license to grow medical cannabis for ourselves, my husband and I. Um, so I've been growing for 12 years, and uh, I've, we basically grow everything organic 
it's a very small uh, operation. It's just for us. So, um, but throughout it, I've been learning a lot about cannabis, and um, I started sort of developing other products. And uh, because I come from the age of the menopausal woman, uh, I was having problems personally, um, and uh, the, all the sort of pharmaceutical things just didn't work for me. They actually made it worse. So I started developing my own product called Bliss, and um, they're in the gift pack, the uh, swag bags that you have. I brought a, a larger one that you could pass around and open and smell. It has THC in it. Yeah, thanks. It has THC in it. Um, I brought it over here. I have a German passport and a Canadian passport. I didn't have any problems, but this can man auch so vielleicht können Sie das rum. Dankeschön. Anyway, so I started making this for myself, uh, and then some of my friends wanted to try it out, and then some of my younger friends wanted to try it out, and they had a different experience, and um, it doesn't work on men, but if you, if you um, like women and you want to make them happy or whatever, then uh, it'll be good for you too, I think, in the end. Um, we're also developing other products. Um, we're making suppositories for menstrual pain and other kinds of, you know, women's pain, um, that's going to be a higher amount of THC and uh, CBD, 25 milligrams of each in, in that one. Um, and also um, massage oils, sort of sexual massage oils, and um, I also make a lip balm, but uh, we're just going to be getting bigger and bigger. We are going to be applying for a license to produce in Canada for a, on a larger scale, and we're going to incorporate Bliss along with um, an edibles line that I started already, but, um, and it's all natural. There's no sugar in it. So, so, so we'd like to get into sort of what women are doing business, but I'd like to introduce the last person on yes. the panel here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> yeah, hello, my, my name is Yolanda Dell, and I just got invited up here. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm working in a cannabis input company called uh, Uva Therapeutics and, uh, here in Germany. And um, yeah, I'm also doing my master's in international horticultural science with, uh, yeah, because I want to go to the cultivation area of cannabis. And I think it's great to be here and I uh, love to meet all of you. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. So, so I'd, like to, yeah, I'd like to make mm -hmm. this a little bit interesting, right? And so there are lots of girls and guys in the, no. in the audience. So I'd like to make this very interactive, but I'd like to kick this off with a couple of questions, right? So, so what is the biggest thing that, that excites you about being a woman in this industry right now? Quick soundbite from any of you. Yeah, I'm also a feminist, so I love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be one so, of the, so how that, that, is that we are integrated, uh, that we can um, expand here, and uh, I think it's a great area. And um, so, yeah. how about this one, right? I mean, from yeah. from my perspective, I mean, the woman's body has an incredible amount of endocannabinoid receptors, and where and when women should healthily take cannabinoids is an issue. It, does that come up in your work anywhere, from a from a health perspective? So I don't try and segment users according to gender. For me, it's more about creating products and encouraging large organizations to create products that are inclusive and applicable for everyone. So I think that while there are certain health effects or conditions that obviously only affect women, there's only a couple that I can think of, um, I think that it's really important to create products that are inclusive for the entire industry and applicable to all users. Okay, so, so that's a good point, but as, as a woman, in fact, what has traditionally happened in the pharma space is that women have not been included in trials. So women are actually being brought into a medical space. That's why I'm saying these things. I don't think that there is a cannabinoid, for example, that's a better woman's argument or whatever, but I think that the woman's market is actually going to be different because cannabinoids work differently 
in a woman's body than they do in a man. So besides any, excuse my French, bra burning on cannabinoids, which is not, I think, anybody's intent up here, there is clearly a different market with different medical needs. And in a medical market, those are going to be different. I mean, Natasha, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that. I mean, the focus on health and women's issues in Europe, I think, is also different than in the United States, for example. <laughs> um, well, I must be honest, I've, I've never really assessed the regulation in Germany from a gender angle, um, but I do know that a large number of prescriptions um, in Germany, according to the report of the Technica Krankenkasse, um, do actually go to uh, older women. Um, so. Uh, that's, that's, that pretty much wraps up my knowledge on that part. <laughs> um, but I do think it's very encouraging uh, that you're seeing more and more women in this industry. And I've also read um, that there are women-only cannabis companies in America. Um, and Canada now, too. And Canada now, too. Um, so, yeah, I, I encourage all of that. Yeah, so my consultancy is 100% female, and I also run a mentorship program for female entrepreneurs in cannabis. So I 100% agree that it's extremely important to lift women up in this industry. There are more female executives in cannabis than any other comparable industry. It's sitting at 26%, which is amazing, but that's actually a 9% decrease over the last two years. So as we see the industry continue to grow, what's happening is as the uh, industry itself gets bigger, female representation and leadership in executive positions is actually decreasing because more and more male executives from outside industries like CPG and Big Food and Bev and Big Pharma are actually now coming in and being hired in leadership and executive positions in cannabis as well. So I think, you know, what's very important is, of course, from a, you know, um, from a company's perspective, to create products with targeted marketing geared towards specific demographics is normal, I think, in every kind of consumable item. Uh, but more importantly, you know, continuing to lift up this industry is completely inclusive and encouraging more and more females to be consumers, obviously, through targeted uh, marketing and certain products geared towards women, but also to lead these companies and to be in advisory positions for this industry, I think will create a larger, more inclusive, more accepted industry overall. Uh, well, I guess with my experience, um, which is more, I guess, patient-oriented, uh, there is a big difference um, how cannabis um, acts in women than it is for men, like women don't need a higher, as higher a potency as men do. Men really, a lot of times, like to, you know, get the highest thing they can get. But um, uh, in, you know, because we all have endocannabinoid systems, and even like within one another, our systems are totally different. It's like almost. Uh, I know people talk about standardization a lot, but I think it's kind of hard to standardize cannabis. I well, that's my question, right? For the Germans, especially the Europeans on this market, how is it going to be possible to standardize medical strains when the information out there is very, very limited and including on that gender basis? What happens if a strain that a government, for example, is going to buy is more effective on men than women? What's going to happen? Is there going to be any movement? I mean, are women just going to be, I mean, that's my question. You know, how are these, do you think that these issues are going to play internationally and in medical specific markets? That is my question. I think with all drugs, they're, they've been studied on men, not just, uh, because women, their, their reactions are so different. They don't like fit into that little slot that when you're studying something. Um, I just think that there are already people sort of um, breeding strains of cannabis that are for women, and I think that's probably the only way. And I mean, even within different women, because our endocannabinoid systems are so different, something might affect you differently than it affects me. But, but, okay, so my question is, from, so from a regulatory perspective, because those are where those yeah. questions are going to be asked, especially here in Europe, 
has anything been done? Do any of you, I mean, if you're going into growing as a, as a woman cultivator and distributor, what, is that inspiring for you? Is that not interesting mm -hmm. to you? Is that a th gone th issue? I mean. I think it's not the most um, important question right now because we have to uh, make, because I, I, I'm a fem feminist and I want to have like strengths for women only, but uh, which are better for women, but I think it's um, more important to make a, a, to a, a difference between the um, illnesses and not between if you're a woman or men because it's like maybe it's better to have like a strain only for um, inflammatory things or like to, to, be, uh, to make more research into the illnesses and not if you're a woman or a man, I think it's not so... The, not the most important topic right now. <laughs> well, fair enough, but, uh, exactly, right? Okay, but, um, excellent. Um, but, but, yeah. but my point is, though, when you have a market that is being defined, for example, by age, so for yeah. example, children, right, or older people, that is my question to you. Where is that coming up? I mean, this is an uncomfortable question yeah, but in this yeah. room, right, already, and why is that? Because, for example, if a child cannot take certain kinds of cannabis, why yeah. would that necessarily be an issue that should be shied away from? Because if we are different biologically, that has nothing to do with anything politically, but this is a drug here. It is a pharmaceutical drug. It's not necessary. it's not a recreational choice here. So if you're a woman, yeah. how does that play in your access? How does that play in market access? These are, like, these are difficult questions. Have any? I think yeah, it's, it's too early maybe. I, th it's, I think it's a, a question of time because in, maybe if in five years, if you have like all the spectra for different, because first of all, we all like, human and then the uh, then we can difference between the illnesses and then uh, between the genders, I think. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, so my degree is in biochemistry and a big part of that is studying anatomy and physiology. I also sit on the board for the American Medical Marijuana Physicians Association, which is the largest collective of cannabis prescribing doctors in the entire world. And I can say with fair certainty that there is not enough substantial evidence to say that the endocannabinoid system is different between men and women. Every single person's physiology is different, which means each of our endocannabinoid systems is different. Mine from yours, yours from his, his from hers. Um, so it's not so much a gender parity thing, it's a person, it's a people parity thing. So it's really important that we can um, increase the amount of comfort that individuals and organizations and countries and legislative bodies have with cannabis so that we can secure funding to be able to do substantial research to be able to say if there really is a difference from age or from gender or from any other demographic markers. Uh, but the information that we have now very clearly says that each, in, in, each individual is different, which is very important in medical cannabis, that we have a variety of different products and that we educate both the physicians and the patients to understand titration, which is trying to get to the lowest effective target dose responsibly. If someone needs to be taking five milligrams of CBD a day, you're not supposed to start them at that. You're supposed to titrate them up. That kind of information is what we really need to be talking about um, and understanding, yes, there will be certain products that are specific for women and certain products that will be specific for men, but only if it's a condition that affects men versus women. Other than that, there should be you know, products that are inclusive, safe, studied, and have substantial evidence to prove their efficacy, and then we need to market it responsibly and get it into the marketplace. And we can't do that if we're, in my opinion, segmenting people off and isolating them into certain buckets and saying, well, only this product should work for you or this product won't work for you. Can I add something that, so, so let me ask this then, because I'm trying to ask some hard, hard questions. So for example, women have a lot of endocannabinoid receptors in their reproductive organs. And I think that there is a discussion right now about, for example, where and how women who are expecting children should react around cannabinoids. That, for example, is a gender specific issue that absolutely plays in consumer product labeling and access and education. So again, this is not meant to be a gender discussion, but there are different ways that the, the body reacts, right? Whether you're a man or a woman, yes, there are different, you know, from a scientific perspective, there are an emerging science. But let's move away from that. Let's look at how all of these issues now are dealing with things, for example, like, you know, market access, the financial side of this. What do you see, I think, there are a lot of Germans, and I kind of am trying to, to bring out the German side of this because the Canadians, Americans are, you know, chatty. So, so from the, 
from the business perspective, what do some of the Germans sitting here <clears throat> talk out, see about the future of um, women in cannabis in Europe? What are, what are roles for women going to be? Lawyers, regulators, entrepreneurs? Just one thing, I'm not German, I'm Swiss German. So I just want everyone to be, I, I've had a tendency of saying we, um, because I've worked here uh, for a, a fair amount of time. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think generally you should just encourage people anyway to get into the industry, whether it be women or men, and uh, get them to analyze it from a variety of uh, perspectives and, and um, yeah. I think like the whole feminism debate is um, that it's totally normal to be in every kind of job because it's, um, I think, I don't like the question that, um, yeah, where can women be? Where is the place for women? The women's, uh, the place is everywhere. So where you want to go, you can go. So it's, um, yeah, don't, I want to do cultivation, I want to be a grower. So it's um, studying horticultural science is something completely different than, um, somebody would expect or something, I don't know. But, uh, so I think we, you can go everywhere. <laughs> I, I don't really believe it's about barriers to access. I just think the industry generally might attract more men than it does women. And that it's probably just a matter of, of time for more of us ladies uh, to be up here. You're, talk, you're talking about um, the industry as like the executive kind of industry or because I think that cannabis attracts more women than it does men in terms of consumers. I'm talking about the executive. Right, okay, okay. Are there any questions for the audience or statements in general? No? Okay, so, so uh, what are the biggest issues then as people in the cannabis industry that you see going forward regardless of gender as leaders in the cannabis industry globally? What are the issues that you see that you would like to address, focus on, or think that you particularly have some innovative, different approach to? Yeah, first of all, we have to um, educate the people about medical cannabis, that it's working, and that I think everybody here knows uh, exactly what we're talking about, but uh, out of this room, it's a very uh, uncommon topic. It's like in Germany, it's still very new, and um, uh, I think very, a lot of doctors are not um, educated enough, don't want to be rude, but they don't, didn't learn about the endocannabinoid system and the studies, and it's, um, so we are at the beginning of educating them, and uh, to, in order to um, get the market, uh, to um, yeah, uh, make cannabis a topic in Germany, because it's still in the beginning, and so we have to yeah, go to the media <laughs> and find studies. Um, well, where I come from, that isn't a problem anymore. Um, but what I'd like to see, like what, what we'd like to do is to have um, a cannabis thing that's more accessible, like the way it already is in California where they have spas and they have um, uh, dinners that are, you know, paired with cannabis and music things and like, you know, have workshops where the everyday person could come and learn about it, learn how to make hempcrete, what all the other kinds of things you can do with cannabis is. And that's where I'd like to go as a woman because it hasn't been done yet in Canada. Oh no, you don't get to skip out on this. <laughs> <laughs> what was your question again? <laughs> I just want you... <laughs> and a regulatory lawyer and a very overall smart person. What do you see are the big issues coming for this industry? Top two or three. Cannabis industry in general? Yeah. In Europe. In Europe. Um, so I think the question of affordability is probably one of the primary issues. Um, most countries don't reimburse cannabis and um, it can end up being uh, leading to very high costs very high therapy costs. Um, I suppose another, um, the second point would be stigma. And uh, the stigma that uh, 
might prevent doctors from potentially uh, prescribing cannabis and as you noted maybe the the lack of knowledge because I don't believe it's from what I know not been included in the the overall medical education um, unless they they want to specify on that um, and yeah I would say those are my top two very much aligned um, same research and education I think is so important in this space because you know, the mature cannabis industry has really only been around for the last five to six years. And in most countries, it is still federally uh, illegal, including in the United States. So we don't have a lot of federal, we don't have any federal funding to study cannabis. Um, Canada has done a, a great job uh, with some of the research, but they're a country of 34 million people. We've got half that, like, just around Los Angeles. So we um, definitely need to fund more research. We need to destigmatize. And then all of that will lead to commoditization, which will hopefully increase um, the level of affordability for cannabis. It's often the most marginalized individuals that have the most need that can't afford cannabinoid-based therapies that are regulated and therefore tested and considered safe. Um, because of all of the... Uh, capital cost that goes into cultivation, extraction, formulation, and then of course retail, uh, the price of cannabis is still very, very high, even in states like California, where we've had medical cannabis since 1996. How high is it? Uh, for, I mean, if you wanted a vape pen right now, it's 55 US dollars for 500 milligrams. How, how many dollars per gram of dried cannabis? Of dried cannabis, anywhere 10, 15. It's, yeah, it's 25 years. Over yeah. 25 years. Yeah, but again, we've had, a, we've had legal cannabis in California since 1996. Yeah, it's the largest cannabis market in North America, and it's still unaffordable for many consumers, which is why they turn to the black market to purchase cannabis that they need as medicine. You know, even in California, where it's a recreational state now, a majority of your consumers are medical or therapeutic, meaning they're using it for a chronic debilitating condition, like a disease, or they're using it for sleep, pain, you know, something more in the therapeutic realm. And again, it's those marginalized individuals that often cannot afford to purchase legal tested cannabis. And therefore, you know, they're buying uh, a black market, you know, cannabis that they're putting into their body. And that's where I really think one of the biggest problems in the industry is, is we need to increase the uh, level of affordability for tested regulated cannabis products. I'd like to brainstorm among the ladies here. Um, so legalization in countries where there has already been medical cannabis um, often creates a, a merge and a divergence between the two sectors. Um, so I'm just wondering how would you uh, suggest that you keep them separate if it's necessary at all? Um, how, would you, how would you do that? I have, I have some interesting thoughts on this, which people may or may not agree with. I mean, I, I personally think that, and there's someone who wants to think, say something also, but I personally think that the focus right now in Europe on the medical market, which is really where the focus is going to be, uh, despite all of the excitement, is actually very, very good, because I think that this is really a big enough region for the first time outside of Israel, outside of Canada, where the medical market can be studied and those issues, in fact, I mean, much, much more readily and I think deeply than has already been done across the board. And I think that that is the potential here. So I would say from my perspective, while there are always outlanders, uh, Holland, what is going to go on in Switzerland? Who knows? But I think that, you know, to be honest, I think there is a really important need to keep a focus on a medically reg regulated market, as we do know these, by a region. So while you know recreational is coming, Canada is leading the way, certain US states have been fighting for this for a long time, I personally think right now that despite the fact that regulation is difficult and frustrating, it is actually a very good thing that Europe is focusing on medical. I, mean, I, just, I just want to add one thing to that. Like, I don't, I don't uh, like to call it recreational, I call it therapeutic. So it's, it's just another level, like it's, it, it, it helps you into a different state of mind, really, even if you're doing it recreationally. So I see it as therapeutic and medical and that they're really the same things. It's just a different um, degree of, from pain, a lot of pain and illness, all the way just to, you know, wanting to relax and have a good time. from the floor. <laughs> Hi, I had a, just a general question about cannabis and cosmetics. 
So we've heard from at least one company at this conference, Chiron, that they've launched a cosmeceutical product called Quita, which is in, I think, lotions and creams. And there's a, there seems to be a bit of a female association with that, given that they've partnered with a, a female icon in Colombia. I just want to know what are your general thoughts on the efficacy? Is this a CBD opportunity? Is it a THC opportunity? Is this a market we should be excited about for women, for men? Would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I've been doing a, a bit of research into the CBD products available in Europe, and actually there seem to be female as well as male face creams. Um, I think the, the shampoo, the CBD shampoo is gender neutral. Um, so at least the product lines I've seen, of course, some face creams might be more targeted to women, but generally the CBD um, cosmetic ranges seem to be fairly uh, gender neutral. Um, I know in the States where we definitely have a much higher variety of products, there are certain lines that are geared specifically towards women. Most of them are cosmeceutical. There are some lines that are geared specifically towards men that are like post-workout products, CBD for muscle recovery. Um, so I think that that's just a company that's making a smart move, seeing a huge uh, opportunity in the market to create a product line that is geared and marketed specifically towards women. Other smart companies will create and market products specifically towards geriatric people. Um, some will market directly towards men, and I don't fault them for that at all. In fact, I think that that is needed to increase the overall comfort with cannabis when you can see it incorporated and infused into more mainstream products. So I think Chiron is you know, doing a great job in helping to lower the barrier of comfort globally whenever you start seeing CBD in uh, cosmetics and uh, common products. I don't think it's a big opportunity for THC personally if it's a true cosmetic. I can't see in my mind when there would be, but... I think that that, also, that question also here in Europe is going to be different. I mean, getting an insurance company to cover a cosmetical product, right? I mean, let's say, you know, women of childbearing age, for example, are going to, I think, be very, very large medical consumers. That is not a cosmetic product. <laughs> but but I so I think that that is a very important market here that is developing along more of and please correct me if I'm wrong from the regulatory side the sort of edibles consumer safety side that is not really medical in Europe that is where that I think is developing. I think the edible uh, CBD um, topic is from what I. From what I know, I don't think you can have CBD, uh, sell CBD edibles in Europe. Not yet. Not right. yet, yeah. right. Um, so uh, that's all I know on the edible aspect. Um, but I know, um, you know, many people really like CBD oil um, and, yeah, men as well as women. Uh, th th oh, sorry, there's... I just wanted to address something that she said about... Um, THC not in topicals uh, on cosmetics. No, I was thinking more of like um, sports creams and things like that. Yeah, yeah, Just, yeah. Like for pain. Foundation. When I'm thinking mascara and concealer, oh. I don't really think THC. Yeah. But no, absolutely topicals. Um, there's definitely a massive market and already some incredible product lines that are specific for topical application. Mm -hmm. Question. Question from the floor. Thank you. Um, this is kind of a statement, and then question. And it's interesting because in Canada we've been servicing <clears throat> with cannabinoid therapy um, <clears throat> patients, PTSD sufferers and other mental health issues and that's been in predominantly um, kind of male driven or dominated professions uh, but one that's always gone kind of uh, not as, hasn't been in the forefront has been nurses and nurses suffering from PTSD and nursing is a, obviously a more of a female dominated profession. So we haven't been communicated to as um, manufacturers and uh, providers uh, of uh, medical cannabis. Uh, the, uh, it hasn't been forefront, like front and center. Is the, not women's health uh, issues in that there's health conditions are specific to women, but there are um, professions that are where women are dominant. And, and there hasn't been representation or a voice, I guess, for that, for that part of the industry. So is there, uh, could there, should there be a, well, there obviously should be a regulatory or body, because we are in a regulatory-driven uh, market, 
or a industry voice, such as a industry alliance, uh, that then mandates a percentage or portion of the representation, no different than it would be for an indigenous uh, persons, uh, that uh, uh, you know, female-specific concerns are, are heard, uh, and that becomes um, kind of necessary uh, across, across the board in mature cannabis markets. Is, is that a question? Because, I mean, I think this is actually playing out some interesting ways. So, for example, I'm just going to quickly say this. For example, right now in Germany there is a push you know, to get a nonprofit industry association going. I think that's going to be good for both yep. men and women in the industry and patients. But in Canada, for example, this is already playing out in some interesting ways. For example, Canadian doctors are complaining to Health Canada about how difficult cannabis is and how we can't check on dosing and da-da-da-da-da. And then you have the Canadian Nurses Association coming back in and saying, uh-uh, you're not taking this away from our patients. So to the extent that, you know, is that a gender issue? No. Yes, there are more female nurses. But I would say that, for example, in that particular case, you have women, as uh, I guess nurses are mostly you know, women at this point, coming out very strongly on an issue which could have gender lines, but it didn't. And the fact that the Nurses Association in Canada was so direct about saying, no, we are not going to take this away, and as doctors, I don't care if you like it, that means more studying, I think was one of the most important things behind getting Health, Health Canada in to commit for five, the next five years. I don't know, that's my opinion. But I think that those are the kinds of interesting things which are going to start to happen. So, um, for me, I don't think, I think that any time that there is a lack of representation for a certain demographic's voice in government or in industry, that needs to be addressed. So whether it's women, whether it's people of color, whether it's indigenous, whether it's age, um, I think that there absolutely needs to be, if it requires an organization to advocate for those individuals, and there should be that organization to advocate for those individuals because government and legislation and industry should be inclusive, and that means addressing the individual and unique issues that do pertain to a certain demographic. I don't think that it means necessarily passing laws that require you know, certain metrics or quotas, but, but maybe it does. But I certainly agree that if there is a lack of representation in any government or industry, um, then there should certainly be organizations that, you know, evolve to fill that gap. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was just going to kind of add to that. From, from my perspective, and, and I'm not sure if the room would share this or not, um, but, uh, you know, women have been very effective in driving and changing and shaping policy. So, uh, and, and it, there is, uh, I think, uh, more of that should obviously happen. Um, I think the industry, from a you know, finance perspective or manufacturing, would would welcome you know if that there was a lobbying effort uh, for for that to happen. So I think it just needs a champion or a hero that's going to kind of drive that, uh, and that requires resources uh, that are financial, more often than not. And uh, there's nothing wrong with 10 cents a euro a gram or or 50 going towards something to support that. So. Uh, if it's tabled, I'd support it anyway. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. So, so maybe then we can, we can try and keep a thing on. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for all listening. It's not really just a gender issue. I think it's more of a person issue. But I think this was a wonderful panel. Thank you again for making it happen. And thank you all of our wonderful participants for being up here. Thank you again. <laughs>